On the breakdown tonight, the Crusaders are Super Rugby Champions for 2019. Congratulations. Also tonight, the coaches box. Who's in and who's out in Super Rugby? And how does that impact on the AB's head coaching role? Plus, we continue our Grassroots Local Heroes Series. This week, we're in Takaka. All ahead, it's the breakdown. Hello and welcome to the breakdown. Well, seven days ago, we were at the Ponsonbury Rugby Club for the announcement of the All Blacks. Tonight, we are back in studio. We're back at headquarters. This is our new studio. We're excited to be with you tonight as, yes, we've crowned another champion here in New Zealand, the Crusaders, winning Super Rugby again for 2019. Same team, though. Here they are. Ali Williams, Stephen Bates, Carl Tanana. Gents, we're all down in Christchurch. Have we all warmed up? That's the first question. I was in the portacom so on Friday, oh, so, you were I was, so I'm happy, mate. I was down there the whole time, Jeff, not just at the end, like oh, you, yourself. Oh, well, you were sitting sideline. Uh, yeah. Beautiful game. Beautiful game. Beautiful uh, game. We enjoyed it, Ellie, didn't we? I mean, it was a great event. The fans were out in force. Yeah. The Jaguaros added to the occasion, their fans as well. It was, it was a great event, wasn't it? I mean, it was freezing. Um, <laughs> I, don't think, I, don't, I don't think you'd replay it again. I mean, it was pretty boring rugby, I'm going to be honest with you, for your, your showpiece, but... Um, Crusaders won, my team won, and you know, uh, yeah, oh, another, another yeah, trophy. Team again. Another trophy. <laughs> oh, that's the only reason you went down there. For the rest of your career, you could say, my team. Well, Steph has been saying it all season. She was adamant the Crusaders were going to win, and you were right, Steph. We all concede. I'm always right, Jeff. You'll come to know that I'm always right. Get used to it. <laughs> and news this week, as we know, the All Blacks announced their rugby championship squad last week. But there's been a couple more team announcements since then. With the rugby championship looming, the big players are making moves. Liam Squire will play for the Tasman Marcos in the Mitre 10 Cup this season for the first time in over four years after making the decision to rule himself out of international selection for personal reasons. The Wallabies have named their squad for the rugby championship, including the shock omission of Quade Cooper. The 74 Test Wallaby has fallen out of favour with selectors and could miss out on the World Cup entirely. And from one former Aussie bad boy to another, James O'Connor has flown to South Africa to join the Wallabies camp in hopes that he can make a late run into their World Cup squad. Puma's coach Mario Ledesma has chosen to leave out international wings Juan Moff and Santiago Cordero from his rugby championship team in favour of Argentina-based players. Finally, the Black Ferns have lost to France 25-16 in their Women's Super Series match in San Diego. They'll face England in their last game of their tournament next Monday. Now, interesting, in the Wallaby squad, no Quade Cooper. Is that a surprise, or is that it's a, a great surprise question. to me? Because a couple of months ago, we were talking about Quade Cooper. His form of the Rebels guys was really, really good. Where's he fallen out of favour? Why has he fallen out of favour? He has got to play the All Blacks uh, in two Blues Low Cups if he's going to be part of it. History against us, not great, KT. Um, but still, for me, surprising not to see him part of the wider group. Oh, 100%. I would have had him. I think the way he played the season, he couldn't have done anything much more to, to get himself back in there. So, obviously, I think it's a personal stuff thing that he's not in there with the coach or something. Then James O'Connor, I mean, getting a... Which getting is a surprising in itself yeah. to come out of nowhere to get an opportunity yeah. to play. It's not like there's any exposed form that you can go on other than playing over in Europe, which maybe he's been doing the job. But I think it's, in some ways, maybe a little bit of panic, Ellie. Yeah, I mean, it just goes to show the importance of a relationship between player and coach. Mm. Um, you know, we would all sit here and say Quade's probably been the form 10 for Australian rugby the whole season. Now something like this happens, you think, why? And the dynamics of a team, is there's so much more the dynamics of a team rather than just what you deliver on the field. And it's great to see James is back and making himself available. Um, always been a great talent. It's always been oh, a great yeah. talent. And that's something they are making. But he's a, he's a talent on the rugby field, that's for sure. But you wouldn't think the strife the Wallabies in, especially the standoff role, that you would still roll the dice with Quaid for the rugby championship? You've got to remember also as well, though, you're still searching for a fullback because mm. they've lost one. Obviously, Israel Falau is not going to be yeah. a part of it. I look, at, They've got some ground to make up for me, Batesy, in the next 
next couple of months pretty quickly to be contenders at a Rugby World Cup. Yeah, definitely they do. I definitely agree with that. They've got some real ground to make up. If you're making a top four at the moment, they're not in it. But when we talk about Craig Cooper, I think his best was absolutely outstanding. But I think his worst was also pretty bad. And we saw that. I was with you, Jeff, yep. down against the Hurricanes. So I think what you got, at your best, you're world class. At his worst, he was a long way off the pace. And if you talk about relationships, I suppose if you needed a reason to drop him, he gave you the odd reason. You know? Yeah, and like I say, two of those four test matches you go into play are against the All Blacks, if he was going to play. So that's not a direction, it appears, that they are going to head. Well, it was just one big game on the weekend in terms of Super Rugby. It was the Super Rugby final. It happened in Christchurch, and it was a dominant performance from the Crusaders. They were all class. They won their third title in a row. Kate, you called the game. We've talked about them a lot this season. There was an air of inevitability about the way they went about their business, and they adapted, and they were the better team on the night. I think the word you used, adapted, that's what they did. In-game, too. Not many teams can do that. They tried to play wide footy. The conditions dictated that they couldn't, but during the game, they thought, right, this is not working. So they had the leadership to be able to change it. Not many teams at this level can do that. No, I thought, I mean, for me, what happened is they went in obviously wanting to play the game, and then you saw them saying, we don't want the ball. We just want to defend. We'll, we'll make things happen off the defence, and, and that's what happened. Really. Well, they made so many uncharacteristic errors in the first half, didn't they, Bates? So you, you would look at them, and I think they had, I think, eight handling errors. There were 12 turnovers. That's not Crusader rugby. It's not, but I think, and, and we've got to heap the uh, praise on the Crusaders, don't get me wrong, but we also got to give a little bit of credit to the Higuaris. And their defence, they got up in their face, and they saw a couple of big hits from Love and Nini and stuff. So you've got to give their defensive line pressure a lot of praise. But again, I'll go back to what KT said. Just the Crusaders' ability to say, plan A's not working, let's go to plan B, plan B work. Yeah. And uh, for young Diaz Bonisha at first five, he struggled in when the game did adapt and it went to a kicking game, it went to a territory game, it went from set piece to set piece. They weren't able to control that KT and, and you didn't see the best of them but the Crusaders have done this to so many sides. It's not to say they didn't create a couple of opportunities. I mean, just before halftime, they should have scored. You know, the winger, he decided to... He didn't really commit 100% to that move, and he got um, caught up by a scramble defence. But Bonisha, you know, he's played so well kicking-wise the week before against the Brumbies. This week, he probably had his worst game. And then the final, he just can't do that. And I think that the dis distance between a number of sides and the Crusaders and the experience and their ability at home... I, you know, I, I thought... When you're preparing a team for playoffs footy, Batesy, this is a team that has got all the aspects you need, whether it was a game against the Hurricanes yep. the week before where they needed to score some points, the Hollanders, they had to be resilient and they fronted up once again. You look at this performance and this team, how does it rate, say, the last two seasons? Oh, jeepers. The last, last two seasons. Well, I suppose the first time they won is probably the best, if you look at it from a fan, because they had to travel to do it. So I know that way probably more impressive because people were doubting them. But as a performance, I suppose what they did do really well this year, throughout the whole season, they had depth. And they developed that depth. And that depth came to fruition when they lost two of their, their rock stars in the final and they had guys to come in and cover those positions and cover them really, really well. OK, is this an end of an era? Ali, of this group, because I can tell you that this starting back line for the Crusaders is all available for 2020. Yeah. They're coming back, the back line, and that's exciting for them. Yes, they're losing some key players. Obviously, Kieran Reid, you've got Matt Todd. You look at the number of Owen Franks, oh, but I don't think it is an end of an era. They've got the ability and depth to surely carry on. Well, I would judge it more, rather than an end of an era, it was a, as a change of guard in terms of leadership. So you're taking out four or five fundamental leaders that have steered the ship with the coaches. I say now it's people like Richie Mawanga, um, a few of the others that can step up and say, well, actually, we, we respect and acknowledge what's been before us, but now it's our time. Because you can't just keep copying what someone did before you. You've got to make your own, your own path, and that's where I think they'll go. Is that the strength of Razor? Is that what he's got the ability to do and he's shown he's already got the ability to do? 100%. And, and, the, and the guys know that they've got his back. And a guy in particular, Fetu Kamal Douglas. I mean, he's the only all-black that started... or non-all-black, sorry, that started in that pack. And there's word around that he might cap, uh, have the captain's armband. Don't band, forget so. Mitch Dunshay. He Dunshay, was out there yeah. as well. There's yeah, a young guy, Quinton Strange, yeah. you know, who's played a bit uh, during the season. They seem... Um, uh, yeah, Billy Harmon, open side flanker. They, uh, basically, there's, like I say, there's that tier. We always talk about depth. If there's one team that can carry on with this sort of momentum, it's the Crusaders. Yeah. I, I'm not doubting the Crusaders that they, they, they can rebuild and go again. I'm not doubting them. But I do just wonder, with the people like Franks, like Whitelock, who won't be there, like Todd, I just do wonder if other franchises 
see a chink in the armour, whether they're good enough to actually deal with that and beat them, that's a different story. But I just wonder, you know, you come up against a Crusaders pack, minus Franks, minus Whitelock, minus Todd, do they feel a little bit more confident about going out there? And confidence is a massive thing in rugby. If you believe, you can do. OK, so uh, that's a great segue, because I want to talk about the Hawaris then. You talk about if you can believe, you can do. For me, there were two international teams going against each other. That's the quality of the two sides. Now they go on to play the All Blacks, the Pumas do, and the majority of those players are going to go on and do that. If you look at that performance then, Batesy then, of the Hawaris, do they see themselves as being close enough to beat the All Blacks? Oh, I think they definitely do. You know, you've got to take the first 20 minutes. What they did do to the Crusaders, not the All Blacks, but to the Crusaders, they forced them to make mistakes. They forced them into plan B. And that's a, that's a moral victory, isn't it? You know? So if they went out there and played one game, the Crusaders, and went all over them, well, where do you go to from there? They made them go to plan B. The problem was their plan B was pretty good too. Yeah, yeah. I, I look at a number of players. We talked about the locks, but Pablo Montero, he was the man of the match. Uh, Ali, there's the pieces of the puzzle. You, if you can bring physicality, you can challenge anybody. Yeah, I would challenge that they actually created some legitimate go forward through the middle in their um, switches. I, th I don't, and, know, if, I don't and, know if either time team did, though. No, I, I'd say that Haguaris did. They created their own go forward. But what happened is, at crucial moments, their kicking game was horrific. Yeah. And it, it lost the whole game for them. I would say if they had a kicking game that didn't... Just sort of say, here you go, Chief, have it back. You know, we don't really want to win this game because that's what um, but, but, but yeah, Nisha. Nisha. Nisha was doing. He had one of the worst games I've seen yeah. for a long, long time yeah. in a final. If he, they had just kept the ball in hand, I think it could have been a slightly different match. We've said this for a long time, though. If you want to win the Super Rugby title, what have you got to have? You've got to attack this game. A world-class first five. Yeah. A yeah. world-class yeah. first five. You look at all of the teams that have gone and won it, and even when the Reds had it, Quade Cooper was at his very best. When the Waratahs won it, they had um, Bernard Foley at his very, very best. When the Blues won it, we had Carlos say, Spencer. Oh, well, I just... I, you got, I thought you had Crusaders forget. mean. Oh, no, when the Blues and the Crusaders oh, won it. <laughs> <laughs> you can't forget oh, yeah. these crucial links. When the Blues won it, when the Crusaders yeah, and, won it, Dan Carter, Carlos Spencer. Yeah, sorry, Goldie, Andrew I didn't Mertens, want to. You know, Andrew Mertens, and you yeah. think about it, it's absolutely... Uh, the playmaker is so key. What I would like to commend uh, from this game and look at is... And say, so Yako Piper, I thought, had a really good game. The fact we're not talking about any controversy, we're not talking about a TMO decision, it was down to the players, they had it under control, and there was no controversy, and you have to commend that, because it has been a difficult season from time to time. And especially the way the scrums particularly went, because it was Shamozzle, and it could have easily gotten out of hand because of his experience. He didn't become, as you said, the main talking point of that part of the game, and he let the players decide the final the way it should be. It deserved champions, uh, the Crusaders. Uh, they were at home, they earned the right to be at home through the playoffs and they went on and won a title. And for them, it was a celebration and it was family and friends. We had the privilege of going deep into the changing room after the game as they celebrated in style. Yeah, that was uh, unreal. So, uh, something special, just sitting down and taking it all in. Emotions going now because a lot of boys are leaving us as well. So here we go, boys. I'll be back one day, but um, yeah, for now it's just enjoying this moment. Uh, I guess I'll reflect uh, on our time. Hey, I guess I'll reflect on our time uh, when we're, we're really calm down. But at the moment, I just want to enjoy this moment. Players. It's great to see all the kids and all the families and um, I suppose people coming from all different corners of the world. So uh, they're great people here, really great people. Me and my last game, uh, it's a nice way to go out. Uh, just happy, happy for the team. Um, this group puts in a lot of hard work, especially the management. Um, so it's just awesome for everyone you know, just to get a reward. getting better. It was just how the team um, I ground them out. But it's all the work that we did um, you know, through the year. <laughs> yeah! We are Crusaders, Crusaders, had a chance to do it again. Let's go! We were born for this, born for this, but never do it again. How good's this? How good's this? There's some boys that are going to be leaving. 
No, it's going to be a different team next year, but we, you know, we're just going to enjoy the, having their company. Um, and it's going to be quite an emotional next couple of days. Awesome. Uh, to be a part of this team, and you can see the culture the boys have built here over the years, it's, it's awesome to be a part of. It's unreal. It's just the best times of your life to see all the boys. You know, you work so hard together for a year, and so it all pay off. It's yeah, unreal. He scored the first try. <laughs> Fantastic. Obviously, this is why we play. We have moments like these and have our friends and families and band, obviously partners here, so you can't beat it. <coughs> Elliot, I reckon if you put the goggles on, you could have snuck in there. Yeah, well, look, you saw Corey Flynn jump in there with Cody Taylor, <laughs> just sort of try me in, thinking he's still a player, you know? Um, I don't know why they do the goggles. That's going to make them... Whew. That's health I'm and safety, safety, mate. Why hasn't Steph got a pair? Why hasn't Steph got a pair? She was... Uh, what do you mean, why? What? Well, she picked the Crusaders, why didn't she? No, but did you yeah, not get yours? Here. Steph might be getting yours in the mail. Torpedo 7 <laughs> made a fortune, that's all I'll say. An absolute fortune, <laughs> Torpedo 7. I, I tell you what, it's pretty special to get some cameras in there and oh, see, the, see the environment and just see... See the raw emotion on different people. You've got Bryn Hill kissing people, really undecided in life, and then you've got um, other people like Owen oh, Frank's the most emotional person in the world, like... Yeah. Not my last game, and uh, thank you. For... <laughs> like, I mean, seriously, buddy, you're a legend, and you're going out like. And then, and then you've got you know other people that are just really lapping it up and really enjoying it. It's just so amazing to get footage in, inside a change room like that. And obviously, the community is important to them. Their families are important, and the environment that Razor has set for them has led them to their success. Well, great success for the Crusaders. Unfortunately for the Black Ferns, it was a difficult weekend, losing to France. It's the second time in a row they've been defeated by them. And look, it was their third game in ten days. They're part of this rugby super series. Look, it was always going to be a challenge. Um, you know, they, they played some quality football through the course of this uh, tournament so far. But, KT, they weren't at their best and it certainly showed. Yeah, I think you spoke about the, the schedule of them. They had three games right in a row in a short space of time. They looked fatigued because they made uncharacteristic mistakes. I'll be honest, you know, a lot of handling errors, a lot of turnovers, and that's not their brand of footy. But when I mean, you talk about three games in ten days, that is a challenge, Batesy. Mentally, physically, all of those sort of things. This is international rugby we're talking Talking about all the other teams had the benefit of, of having a buy before they got that opportunity to play. So, I mean, reality is they'll be disappointed, yeah. but they not that they have an excuse. They'll never give an excuse, yeah. Yeah. but they'll have to learn from this and how you maybe have to manage your players. Yeah, they all, and that's where depth comes into it, you know. And they're they're building depth. We've seen that. But one thing I will say, it's not perfect, and I'm not saying it's perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But at least they're playing. You know what I mean? So, for example, they're getting test matches. This is what the Black Ferns have always wanted. Yeah. They wanted to be playing rugby. It's not perfect, but they're playing rugby and they're playing against the best opposition in the world, yeah. which makes them better. So this competition is a genuine competition, a great thing. Maybe scheduling needs to be worked on, but at least they're playing and they're playing good football sides. The top five teams in the world, Ali, coming together and playing each other. Yes, they have the Six Nations in the Northern Hemisphere, but it's nowhere near as strong as this. They've got a couple of test matches for the Laurie O'Reilly Trophy against Australia. So so, as Batesy said, there's great value in this and they are exposing players. Yeah, it's just the evolution of women's rugby. It's just getting better and better and giving more opportunities. I mean, I think, you know, Steve Hansen might go and coach them and can you imagine the budget then? They'd have 58 <laughs> players. They could play whatever they wanted to play. I mean, it, to me, it's just... Is he looking for another coaching job? Yeah, I think so. I've heard he's looking for something else. Oh, yeah, in a few months. He's got, he's got something on before that. But, um, you know, you just go and see how professionalism moves and you could imagine what squad sizes they have if yeah. they were had to do that again. And, and we shouldn't forget that we haven't even played our domestic season. That's yeah. a challenge, isn't it, KT? The fact that our, our Farrah Palmer Cup falls at the same time as Mitre 10 Cup. So they're doing this on the back of club rugby in terms of yeah. preparation. So it does make it a challenge as well. Oh, 100%, you know. And then, like you say, that's all about the learnings you get from it, you know. And it's weird to have your international season before your provincial season. So, But like Basie said, they're playing international rugby now. They'll come back to Farrah Palmer Cup and then they'll also have in between that the Laurel Riley Cup. So, you know, some good, good games. Right. They've got a test match to go. Those are uh, double headers as well. Um, and bef uh, before the All Blacks in Perth and Australia, they take on England as well, though, Batesy. They've got one game yeah. to go. Our expectation would be we'd see a bit of a response. They've got a bye, so they've got a bit of time to recover. Uh, I'd, I'd expect a, a performance that all of a sudden they'll go back up another gear. Yeah, definitely. They won't be happy with their losses. KT said they're quite scrappy. It's unusual for them. They won't, they won't be happy with that. And the beauty about it, you said they've got the bye, so they've got the ability to go away and just recess where they're at, recharge the batteries. And as we know, the side that they played in the World Cup final a couple of years ago. So this is uh, it's going to bring a bit of heat and a bit of excitement. Then they can leave the tournament, hopefully with a victory under their belt, feel, feel happy and fly back home.
That's on Monday morning, Sky Sport 1 at 7.50am, kick-off at 8am against England. Make sure you check that one out. Well, talking of the women's game, it's time now to go to our Locals Heroes. It's week three, episode three. It's time to go to Golden Bay, to Kakaka, to someone who loves the game. They are prepared to travel and play every single week. Courtney Clark's story. from Golden Bay. I've grown up on a dairy farm. So Golden Bay is a tiny little town at the top of the South Island. Um, most people know it as where the whales streamed <laughs> on Farewell Spit. Really quiet, laid back country life. So for work, I'm actually a well, groundswoman at the Fahara Beach Top 10 Holiday Park. And I work on the farm as well. Um, help rear calves down on my grandparents' dairy farm. That's my passion, is, is farming, yeah. Up, get up, hey, up, up, up. In the morning, I have to wake up at about six o'clock, um, feed the dogs, get out the door by eight o'clock to go to work. Work until about 2.30 on a Monday, just because I need to get to training. So I'll come home, feed the cows, feed the dogs, have a coffee bite to eat and then um, jump in the car for four o'clock to, to head over to training. So the drive takes about two hours. It's a windy road. <laughs> stunning though, absolutely stunning drive. I've probably driven this road, what, just this year? Probably oh, 300 times. Easily. I've actually had to buy a new car this year <laughs> um, just to keep up with the travel. So I do that drive probably four times a week. Sometimes in the morning, waking up at 3.30, out the door before four, pick the girls up, be at the gym for quarter to six in the morning. How are you? Thank you. That's good. Already? Surprisingly, I don't get sick of the driving. It's kind of my zen time. Go-to playlists would have to be um, my country, my country bangers. Various rucker. Um, yep, yeah, yeah, with the wagon wheel. <laughs> How did I get into rugby? Um, I was playing Bull Rush at high school and I was probably 12 years old and the boys were like, man, you can tackle. <laughs> yeah, they pulled me along to rugby training and that was kind of how it started. So, so ball, pass. The biggest influence on my rugby career would have to be my dad. He's, um, before I could drive, he was driving me to my rugby trainings in Mochawaka. <laughs> no, I'm just doing what every, every other parent can do. You know? Her first year with uh, Tasman, she was actually milking cows, so she'd have to get up at half past three and milk the cows. So I'd drive her. She would then sleep on the way over. She'd play and then sleep and then come back and milk in the afternoon. Courtney's a great person. She's an inspiration in rugby. She's a massive character to the team. She's funny, just an all-round good person. <laughs> <laughs> so I should have taken her out then, eh? Yeah. Rugby is, is what I love doing. I love being with an awesome group of girls that love the game as much as you do. I mean, you're going out into battle with your sisters that are, you're all there with a common goal. And that's what drives me to get over the hill two hours each, each way. Players are on the move, so too are the coaches. Up next, we look at the 2020 coaches boxes. Welcome back to The Breakdown. Now, we are normally talking about player movements, but tonight we're going to be talking about some coaching movements. Now, we do know that Hurricanes and Blues coaches are going to be staying the same for 2020. So let's have a look at the Crusaders, Highlanders and Chiefs. We'll start with the Crusaders. Now, of course, Razor Robinson is remaining with the Crusaders, thank goodness. But they are losing Ronan O'Gara, who is off to France. And they're also losing Brad Moore, who is off to Wales. But Jason Ryan is remaining with the Crusaders as well. Moving on to the Highlanders. Now, of course, Aaron Major is remaining as well, but Glenn Delaney is leaving and being replaced by Tony Brown, who's coming back from the Sunwolves. And then finally, moving on to the Chiefs, Colin Cooper is 
standing down, but he's being replaced by Warren Gatland. But what does that mean for Tabai Matson and Nick White? Thoughts, guys? A lot of question marks over all of things. How will you cope, though, when Razor puts up his hand for the All Blacks <laughs> and possibly moves on? Can I... the Crusaders recover? They can, they can recover because I think he would be a fantastic All Blacks coach. Just look at his track record. I wonder where all the players would move then. Yeah. I'll be down to Crusaders <laughs> at the Christchurch. Well, that would be a surprise. What a shock. But look, anyway, seriously, I think there's a lot of discussions to be had here. Let's start with that, uh, guys. Let's talk about that. The fact we talk about the number of changes that could, could happen around Super Rugby, and they are happening. But there's still a lot of unknown come the end of the year. So there are going to be a number of coaches who might put up their hand for the next level. John Plumtree might put his hand up for the next level. It's not a one-man job for the All Blacks. So we think about Razor Robinson. He was in the media uh, yesterday talking about the fact, saying, what, what, what more can I do? Your expectations are, does he put his hand up? And how does that shake things up even more? Yeah, oh, I mean, from a personal view, I don't think it's wise for Razor to go and take the All Black job just yet. I think he's too much of a polarising character to go and fit in under um, Steve Hansen when he, he resigns. So um, it's going to be interesting. But as you say, that's going to um, determine what the Crusaders do. You know, I think... You look at the skill of Razor, how he brought in Ronan O'Gara. I mean, Ronan O'Gara was in Paris doing bugger all. Not a lot, right? But he's a great coach. And you can see what's happening. He's going to La Rochelle. He's going to be head coach there. And it's just that experience. So, you know, it, it brings a lot of elements to New Zealand rugby, bringing other coaches in. So who knows? Who knows where he's going to go? I mean, they've got to replace Brad Moore as well, though, Batesy. So they've got a couple there. Jason Ryan's going to hang around. But the landscape could change very, very quickly. And... and can you find people to replace what you've just lost? Yeah, well, there's obviously plenty of good coaches around this. The thing about New Zealand coaches is there's plenty of coaches around the world where they're off contract to come back and coach in New Zealand. And that's the other thing about we talk about the Crusaders too. Not only do they have some quality players moving on, they've also got quality coaches moving on. So, to be honest, it'll be real, real interesting if Razor did go up, what happened there? And, and I don't necessarily think it is a bad thing for him to jump up. Why not? Like, he doesn't have to be assistant. I know Razor does his, his, things his way. Why couldn't he jump up to be the AB's job? Um, people have said that he needs some overseas experience, but is that a prerequisite to being an All Black coach? And I'll be honest with you, talking to a couple of All Blacks who've um, been in the All Black scene for a long time, said Razor's probably one of the guys I've actually really wanted to play for. I was found it quite interesting, you know. So it's, um, I mean, we've got guys like Daryl Gibson potentially could come in and fill a hole there. Canterbury man finish at the Waratahs. There's, yeah, exactly. So there, there are a lot of people who'll be putting up their hands for that job, right? I mean, you look at that squad, you look at those players that they're going to have, those guys we talked about who are coming back. Yeah. You, you, you just got to look at what Crusaders have built their success on, and it's keeping things in house. It's keeping the traditions um, and all that, the, the great work that they've done built through. So people like Daryl Gibson coming back into the fold brings that element of stability, but yet a variation. So to me, I don't think they'll go too far from a Crusader man. What about someone who, who's been coaching over the Scunwells and Scott Henson? What about him? Well, he's connected to Canterbury. He has been connected. Yeah, yeah, he's got yeah, that connection. Yeah. And this, it's going to be very... It was difficult this year to coach the Scunwells. It's, it's going to be, be ten times more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, now, he's done pretty well. before he starts sinking, you reckon. Yeah, I will, right. I will, I'll, I'll, jump I'll, ship, mate. While you say that, actually, while you say that, while I remember as well, uh, my understanding is the Sunwolves will be in the comp... There is no way they will not be in the competition this the, uh, next year at this stage. They'll uh, have a team and I'm not sure they'll be in uh, the uh, They'll be... They'll, 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 have yeah, they'll have a team. Uh, it's a team. Coach. <laughs> I'm, 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 well, does that mean that JK is not that knowledgeable? Because JK told us a few weeks ago that some Wolves wouldn't be in this... It's about time you had a shot at him for not being yeah, well, here. He's not he's here. Not he hasn't around, been here you know. for four he's, weeks. He's, I mean, he's picking balsamic vinegar at yeah. the moment in Italy. In Italy. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't he live the life of riding? That's not so bad, right? It's not so bad. That's not so bad. Let's talk about the big discussion around the Chiefs. Warren Gatlin is coming home. There is no certainty about his coaching staff. He's obviously got to prepare for a Rugby World Cup. You would like to think there's some continuity. Do you expect continuity, Batesy, in Hamilton or some sort of it? You've got Roger Randall, Tabai Matson, um, Neil Barnes. You've got a lot of experience there who are ready to go. What will this man do? What I, what I do know about Gats is he does things his way. OK, so, so we can second-guess them all he wants, but if he's got his plan, that's the way he'll go. He's got a relationship with Roger Randall. Um, that's from his playing days, you know, so whether he'll keep Rog on, which oh, I personally think through, through watching the Mulu's attack and also the Chiefs when he took over halfway through the year. So I think he'll keep Rog on. Other than that... I'm not sure, but what he will have to do is he's going to have to get some kind of real strong assistant because you've got to remember he's not there. 
the yeah. following year. So he's going to have to have someone. He's got a four-year contract. In year two, he's not there. He's going to have to have someone to come in to steer the ship the way he wants it steered. How problematic is that? Ali, when you look at that and you look about the fact he is, he is going to be away for a whole season while he coaches the Lions mm. and how difficult will it be to implement the way that he wants to play in one year and then someone else pick that up? Yeah, well, I mean, he did do it for Wales, didn't he? He had a, a year stood down when he was coaching um, the Lions. So, I mean, he knows how to do it. He does, you're right, Batesy, he is a, um, it's his way or the highway and, um, you know, he will want a pretty sturdy right-hand man. What about yourself? You put your... Name in the Mate, battle. I gave Getty a ring the other day and he said, he, I said, Stephen Bates, he, he hung up on me straight away. So <laughs> I think I've got this? the answer, mate. So I don't know, don't see me there. <laughs> Perseverance me, old mate. I'll, go I'll again. ring him for you. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ring again. him for you. <laughs> so, uh, KT, uh, difficult as well, though, because if there are other co coaching opportunities, you'd like to think that Nick White, Tommy Manson, who is coaching with Fiji at the moment, as is Neil Barnes, they get at least an opportunity to know their future so that they can maybe start planning and, and looking about where they're going because they've obviously created created something at the Chiefs this year. They managed, through all their adversity, all their injuries, to find a way into the playoffs. Yeah, 100%. And the thing we've got to remember with Tubboy, he's a Canterbury man too, so that could be a potential option going forward as well for him. So he's been around, he's done international footy as well, and now he's laid the platform here. So he's becoming a very, very good coach. You would not, I think, want to lose him. He's a guy too that was targeted by the Blues. He was targeted, you know, um, by the Crusaders and then took the opportunity at the Chiefs. Um, how great would it be for someone like him to be learning off Warren Gatland if you're trying to develop a coach? And, you know, you talk about to the two hemispheres coming together, Batesy. Yeah, and as you talk about the two hemispheres coming together, the two hemispheres has come closer in how they play rugby over the last few years. So someone like Tumboy might be good for him, but I do believe he'll bring someone in that more or less fits what he, exactly what he wants. As I said, okay. Warren's a man who knows what he wants. Here's a question for you. They've got a young man by the name of Damien McKenzie who doesn't really fit the mould in terms of the way he plays the game. Is Warren Ball a real thing? Everyone talked about this thing, the way, the way that they play. And then you've got this excitement machine who's going to be back next season, Ali. Uh, is that going to suit this young man? I mean, it, it is hard. We've talked about um, Quay Cooper before in terms of his relationship with um, his, his coaches. You have to find a connection with your coach. You have to have your coach back you and say, actually, I love the way you play and I want to grow you as a player. And um, it is Gats does have those elements where he's like, Mate, you don't fit my thing, so, you know, get out of here. So it is going to be quite interesting whether the movement comes when, when a strong yeah. coach like Gats comes back. I'll say on that, Gats can be quite ruthless. If he doesn't need you, he doesn't need you. But what he is also very good at, he's also very good at developing, re developing relationships with key people. So he's going to have to develop a relationship with him, and he will. He's, he's obviously a world-class coach. Mm. And then if you give him players like Atu Moli and Nathan Harris yeah. and, and Brody Retallick and Sam Kane and uh, Peter Sawakula, these guys who are outstanding this year. You'd like to think with that talent level and this back line that really did develop in 2019, Brad Webber's got back in the All Blacks. There's plenty to like about the fact that he's going to have some international quality players to build on. And, and the thing is, he's still going to have the, the, the players, like you said, like you just spoke about, that can play that crash bash stuff that he loves, that physical nature, especially whether it be in the forwards or in the centres, and give D-Mac some space on the outside. And like you said, there's a reason why he's one of the best coaches in the world. He can adapt to that, so I think he'll be fine. He'll oh, be awesome. I, I still think, you know, I'd like... I'm sure the Chiefs would like those decisions to be made sooner rather than later because they've got to recruit players, yeah, they've yeah, got to build yeah. the depth in their squad, they've got to start building towards the fact they have to establish so much in Warren Gatlin's first year. Well, the Highlanders are, in reality, in a difficult situation. They're losing so many players, so many players going offshore. Tony Brown is returning. You get the sense they're a bit like where the Chiefs were this season. It's about rebuilding. Tony Brown, though, is the master at getting the best out of his players, and they'll welcome his return in, in Dunedin. I understand. Yeah, he'll, be, he'll be great to have him back. The one, one of the problems I do see, though, is what Tony Brown's really good at. He's going good at going around and picking players that suits what he wants. He sees things in them, but he's going to be at the World Cup with Japan when Mighty Ten Cup's going on. So he's not going to be able to see those guys in the flesh. And that, to me, is a real character trait of his that he's good at. He's not going to be able to go and watch the Mighty 10 Cup live because he's with uh, the Japanese national team. So there's a challenge there. Um, Aaron Major's responsibility, though, they'll be communicating. Ellie, you've still got guys strong in key positions. Aaron, Sh Aaron Smith, Josh Iwani, uh, a new All Black in 2019. If you've got that, you've got something you can build around. Yeah, I, look, I will... 
knowing Aaron Major in, in terms of the person and what his experience have been in Europe, I wouldn't um, be surprised if you see him bring in some European coaches um, down there just, just to throw something different at, at Super Rugby, um, which they haven't seen. Look how Rodan O'Gara, I keep talking about it, well, how successful he was. So with Aaron Major still at the, at the head, there's, there's options he could go anywhere. I'm really looking forward to seeing um, Tony Brown's cheese cutter every week <laughs> rather than Razor Robinson's side do thing. So it's really just chucking a new dynamic to a coach. A style off. Oh. You're just yeah, looking I, for I, a style I, off. I just love this variation that we're creating in Super Rugby is, is there's rather than what's on value. the field. There's entertainment Sorry. value. OK, let's talk about what could happen post-World Cup. There are a number of coaches, I'm sure, who are considering their futures. We know that Joe Smith has said he is ending with Ireland and he's going to take a break. My question is for how long would Joe Smith take a break? And then all of a sudden, is there an opportunity for him? Jamie Joseph, how long is he going to continue on remembering the success that he had here uh, with uh, the Highlanders? There are options, KT, where there could be some guys who, in 12 months' time, are available. Or if the right guy put up his hand and said, you know what? I'm going, to be, I'm going to go to be the All Black head coach. I'd like you to come with me. All of a sudden, once again, the mix could change very quickly. And that's the thing. It's such a fluid situation at the moment. And, and like the players that are going through, you just don't know like, who's talking to who behind the back doors. And Jamie Joseph, obviously, we know the quality. Joe Smith, obviously, he's a coach's coach. He's going to be coaching sooner rather than later, I think. Yeah. Okay. Do we, can we speculate on anything? Can we look into the future? Yeah, we can. Ali, you were telling me before the show, mate, that uh, you reckon Joe Smith will be at the Chiefs when Warren's over with, uh, with the Lions. Lions, mate. You know when you tell a little fib? You've got to tell it with authority, <laughs> my good friend. So if that's your story, I'm quite happy to go with it. But there is, there is some room there in the some... place you're saying that uh... Joe Smith might sneak in and work with Gats. Um, at the Chiefs there. Um, look, there's, well, all a, sorts a, of, there's all sorts of speculation around that's lifestyle. Yeah. So? <laughs> no, 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 because because they'll just take it. Joe Smith, he just wants a break, mate. Yeah. He's done magical things for Ireland. He'll say to um, Gats, Gats, you go and do the Lions, no problems, mate, you beat me to that job. Um, I'll take your Chiefs off you, and then just back door... <laughs> See you, Gats. <laughs> <laughs> and Gats comes back, he's stranded, you know. He's back at Waipu Beach. <laughs> 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 but if we look at all of these options, right, and you start talking about a four-year cycle, are we looking at great insurance policies for us? If you're talking about the All Blacks head coach, and that's what's going to happen post this Rugby World Cup, you've got Mike Cron, who is moving on. You've got Steve Hansen, the All Black coach, who is moving on. You've still got uh, a, a number of uh, in that group who are, are going to be uh, around. You've got Ian Foster, of course, and you've got Scott McClellan. Cloud, okay, who's done a really, really good, strong job with them, did a great job with the Highlanders. So they're going to put their hands up. And like I say, there are other coaches around the country who are going to be targeted. Can, for you, do we look around the country and look at combinations and you're going, you know what, I hope they get together. Say, so Razor, who do you hope goes with Razor and says, you know what, I want to join you? I don't know, Razor's a little bit a different kettle of fish, and that's, and KT, I'll pick up on what you you said. The thing about them is they've got a mould. So, for example, you could, oh, the perfect thing would be to have Gats, and then we'll have Razor, and then we'll have Joe Smith. Oh, what a team, awesome. Yep. But they might all clash, you know, because a lot of them are head coaches. So that's the way to do it. And, oh, that's not how I'd do it. So it's about, like, just like a team. Well, John Plumtree said he wants, he wants to have some role Another good going coach. forward. You know, you know, so Tony Brown, yeah. the experience him coming back. But, but if, if are you putting your hand up? I yes. notice you're putting I'm your. I'm being you know, very polite. You can do line, out, line outs or. No, no, no. I'm, I'm just saying, if we look at what the success of the All Blacks has been about, it's been the greatest players playing together and working together. Why is it not, which it was, the greatest coaches coming together and working together to create the greatest team? Didn't because we had that though? Steve Hance, that's what I'm saying. Graham Henry, when he got selected, he brought in Steve Hanson Wayne and Smith. Wayne Smith, which we could all say were probably the best coaches of their time then. Now, So, so it, it is possible. I think the draw of the All Black jersey can create people to go, right, I'm going to drop my ego because I want to be the best and I want to work with the right people. I, I wouldn't rule out any options, to be honest. That's well said. That's succinct. I better get out. So I've done taken it. How many done shows? You've taken how many done shows? Done shows going going that? Your Twenty shows. <laughs> contribution we've had from you into the, it just took a new set. It took yeah. a new set, and we've I seen the best it. of you. Well, look, uh, the reality is there's going to be huge competition for that role of the coaching of the All Blacks. But if it comes down to dancing, I think there's only one coach that's going to get the job.
Stick around, still to come, some superstars of rugby are off. So who's staying? It might not be as bad as first thought. Welcome back. Now, this Friday, the All Blacks leave for Argentina. And the team assembled today in Auckland. So the players have had a week to digest their All Black selection, especially those new caps in the team. Now, some even got to play a game of club footy over the weekend. So let's take a look at who some of those players were. Now, we had Carl Tuinakawafe, who played for Takapuna over the weekend and apparently had a good hit out against Massey. And some other players to turn out for their club over the weekend. We had Offa Tuuanga Fassi, who played for Auckland Grammar Tech, with his two other brothers, making it a family front row, which is pretty cool. Also had Patrick Toi Pelotu and Rico Ioane, and they played for Ponsonby, be Ponsonby beating Eden over the weekend. Also had Dalton Papali'i, who played for, played for Pakaranga over the weekend. Brody Ritalik played for Central Hawks Bay. And new All Black Luke Jacobson played for Hal Tapu. So Sonny Bill didn't play for Ponsonby over the weekend again. Now, a little bird tells us that he may have picked up an injury playing for Ponsonby last weekend. And that may have flared up training with the All Blacks this week. So it casts a little bit of doubt on his rugby championship and possibly his World Cup selection, maybe? I, I think there are question marks, Steph. I think, guys, if you look at that, the frustrations he'll be feeling, the fact he's picked up another niggly injury. If he doesn't get on that plane to go to Argentina on Friday, uh, how concerned should he, should we and the All Black selectors be? Have we considered the fact that selectional issues didn't make him available for Ponsonby Rugby Club, which is a fine <laughs> establishment that it is. There actually goes. wasn't Here room for him in that, um, in that team on the weekend after they beat uh, Eden. So, look, huge concern. So all that credibility you got from the last part of the show? <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 just went out the, the door. <laughs> just went out the door. I, on, on a serious note, the, the fact that he hasn't backed up two games, uh, you've got to be concerned. One, from a medical point of view, to turn around to Steve and say, look, he can get through this. And two, from his own view, saying... And he's a great athlete. If there's one man that can do this, it's him. But you've got to start questioning things. Did we start Hard. thinking, though, he needs rugby? Is he, is he one of those guys that, without rugby, can go out and perform at the international level? Or do we believe he just needs a few games under his belt? And time is running out, basically. Yeah, I, I, think, I think he can perform at a high level. But I think everyone needs at least two, three games under their belt to then put their best out there. Not to put out a quality performance, but put their best performance out, which is what we're wanting out of people, aren't we? Can I just say how cool it is seeing the All Blacks running out in their club colours? Mm. The people that it generates going in there and the, the whole buzz around, I reckon it's awesome. It's good to see heaps of Blues guys back there too, KT. Oh, they give them back, hey? No, they're just giving back, mate. Oh, they're, oh, sorry, there it is. They're yeah, just giving back. Put it on the positive side, mate. Enough from, you, enough from you guys <laughs> about the Blues, hey? Enough. Well, no, I agree with you. I, I think it's exciting for the clubs. The fact that you know, I know down at uh, Takapuna there was a lot of people that were out to see Big Carl get his hit out and he got through that you know, really well. It, to, to, those guys are going to need time, Batesy, because those guys are going to have to hit the ground running when they hit uh, Buenos Aires because they're going there without the majority of their Crusaders. Yeah, and that's the thing. You talk about Carl who had a sickness at the end of Super Rugby, so he's been a long time without football and he's a guy that does get... You talk about guys that need football to get better. He's a guy that needs football, so I I, I expect him to play either big minutes or to start against the Pumas in a, next week. Well, seven days ago, they named that 39-man squad, which was going to be 41, but the injuries to Ryan Crotty and Scott Barrett ruled them out. But what we're going to look at here is this is the forwards, the group that was selected, and what we want to do is highlight the players that we know are going to be staying for 2020. So... Owen Franks heading off, Shaw Jackson, Hemipo, Brody Retallick, Kieran Reid and Matt Todd. So you've got five players there. If you go to the backs that were selected, and there's a reason we're doing this, there is only at the moment we know the three players that are heading offshore. And we don't know about Bowden Barrett, actually. Sonny Bill Williams we're not sure about either. So Ben Smith is the only confirmation. So we've talked about this season, 44 players heading offshore in Super Rugby. That's around that number. But if we look at that All Black squad, we've talked about potential All Black coaches. I look at next season, and that's an incredibly talented squad. And we talked about it, I suppose, during the weekend after last Tuesday and going, I don't know if I've been this excited about this bigger group for a long time, KT. Oh, yeah, 100%. You know, to lose five 
you know. Out just of five. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you'd take that any day of the week to be able to keep that consistency of player. I mean, honestly. Yeah, it's, and it, the other thing is it gives you the support when you change the coach because yeah. you, you've got your leadership. Yes, there's a change of captain, but I think there's other guys that will sit in, sit in those positions. It's just exciting... When we look at it, you go, fair, fair, fair. And then when you are pragmatic about the whole situation, you think, well, New Zealand rugby is in very good stead. And when we think there's a problem, something else comes. Something else comes. More and more players start recommitting. You know, at the start of the year, we were thinking, no one's going to recommit. They've all recommitted because of the power of the jersey. And that's something we've always been concerned about, Batesy, in a Rugby World Cup year. And we saw it at the last Rugby World Cup. We're losing a little bit of leadership. And it makes us maybe a little bit vulnerable at at lock, but depending on where Sam Watlock fits after he heads and plays in Japan, does he come back for the All Blacks next year? But I look at that group and you're going, most other countries have a little bit of a dip. Yeah. I don't see much of a dip there. I, I, and there's still guys like David Harvilli, uh, yep. uh, Bryn Hall, uh, yeah. uh, Titoro, Tahuri Orangi, who aren't in that squad, that you go, you know what, Nathan Harris. Yep. I mean, there's some serious depth around. And that, that's the thing about the squad that we had up on the screen, is what you've got to realise is there's going to be a new All Black coach. We can say, it might be this guy, it might be this guy. We don't know. So that new All Black coach will bring his new thinking in. So start a Super Rugby next year. For all those young guns, and there's plenty of young men there, it's game on because there's no alliances or allegiances to anything, and it's a first-in, first-serve. That new coach gets to pick a first all-black squad, so everyone's going to be pretty keen to perform well in Super Rugby next year. And so we've all had time now to look at that squad that has been selected. Are we more confident now, given the form we've seen in Super Rugby, that this group can go to the Rugby World Cup and win, and, I, and win well? Or... Is the margins, we're always talking about the opposition. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere and you've looked at the form of some of these guys, Ali, are they concerned or are we really satisfied with that right now? I think it just reconfirms where we all thought we were at the start of the year. We're in good, we're in good nick, we've got great players and there's no reason why we shouldn't win this World Cup if we do things right, but we've still got to keep challenging ourselves as a team and as a nation to get behind them because things like this aren't, aren't a given. But there are question marks though. Who's their six? What's their combination in their midfield? Who do you expect to get maybe the first opportunity against the Jaguares in that coveted six jersey? I like Frizzell to get a chance, to be honest with you. I really I enjoy Jacobson, but I don't think he'll be the man because it was always was admitted that he's in there because Liam Squire's not. But I'd like Frizzell to get a crack in there. A good good athlete. Athlete. Yeah, real good athlete. And a guy as well, like, and, and for me, when you look at number sixes, you look at guys like Jerome Kaino and you look at Jerry Collins in their prime, they're kind of guys that, uh, that can hurt people, and he's the same kind of player, you know, a player that can hurt him. So I'd like him to go there, to be honest with you, but it'll be interesting to see what happens. I'm with you, Beach. I think the more game time has, especially in that big juice, the more comfortable he's going to be. Last year, sort of come in, was still learning his trade, but he was looking very, very comfortable. Six is a jersey that you grow into. It's not a mm. jersey that you walk in and go, hey, guys, this is mine. It's naturally been mine. So you've, I think, and Steve knows that, so you've got to give him time. Does he have time to give someone like... I, I, I don't know. It's, it's a hard one. I think it's going to be a rotating position. To OK, be if you, I had to throw an option to you in terms of versatility. Is it Dalton Popoletti or is it Luke Jacobson? <laughs> I'm a blues man, so it's uh, Dalton. Don't, 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 put that aside. Put no, that aside. No, I, really, I was really impressed with um, Dalton Popoli this year. He didn't get a lot of credit. He did a lot of work, did a lot of minutes. He got a few injuries towards the end of the season, which sort of stopped his momentum. But to me, he, he was a guy that went away on tour. Everyone went, OK, a selection outside the box. And he got better and better. And that's what you want to see as an all-black coach, to see people... Counter-argument? Yeah, so I think they're slightly different. I think eh, Dalton, time up. <laughs> <laughs> Dalton is a, for me, is a 6-7, yeah. where Luke is a is a, is a 8-6, who I personally believe that Luke can also play 7, but he hasn't yet. So I think they're slightly different in what they do, um, but it'll be interesting to see how that fits into the mix. Yeah, and look, you've got to remember that it's unlikely... I'm um, interested to see Kieran Reid. We're not going to see in, in um, uh, Buenos Aires. We're not going to see uh, Matt Todd. So all of a sudden, Ali Savia, uh, Sam Kane, you expect those to be the guys eight and seven. So the mix, we're going to see a new combination. Uh, I'm interested at Lockwell, who partners Brody Retallick? Is it Petra Tupoloto? Is that the obvious answer for you? For me, oh, I would put Patty in there. I, th I think the way he was in there injuring for the Blues, you see, was absolutely monster. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, you know, he deserves to be there. All right. OK, let's go. We've got more, well, there'll be plenty more chat on that because the test match is coming up in a couple of weeks. Let's go to the notice board with Steph. Yes, on the notice board this week, we have got some club footy finals. So we're going to talk through what finals are happening this weekend for you guys to head along to. 
So, up on the notice board here, of course, we've got the Northland final. They are playing for the Joe Morgan Memorial Trophy. The Taranaki final are playing for the McMaster's Shield. And the Manawatu final are playing for the Hankins Shield. Buller final, the West Coast final, and of course the Southland final who are playing for the Galbraith Shield. So if you are in those areas, go and support your club teams because that's what it's all about. Yeah, thanks, Steph. For all of your great work tonight, Blues versus Star, that'll be a beauty in Invercargill. <laughs> there's a there cracker down there at Rugby there Car at Rugby Park. Crowd attendance. You've, oh, massive. You've got some allegiances massive. up the other end of the country. Have you got yeah, old boys. Old boys. Maris Young followed plays for them. And by the way, Waitakere under 70 girls. Wabby, good luck with the Nationals. My daughter's playing tomorrow. I know you're watching, ladies. Oh, yeah, we're a family show. Yeah, there it's it good for the ratings. I appreciate you watching. <laughs> we shouldn't forget as well this weekend, New Zealand Māori take on Fiji. Here we go. Fiji. Oh, it's going to be dangerous. They're going to be serious uh, danger. Look, it's been a fantastic opening night for us, really, in our new studio. As always, thanks, Steph. Thanks, Ali. Thanks, Bates. <laughs> thanks, KT. Yes. Thanks, our team. He's just stoked he got that in. He's got that in. We'll see you next Tuesday night.